Lisbeth on pärit Austraaliast. Nükastli ülikoolist. Ja ta on interdisciplinaarsuse kehastus. Tema pakkalaurusegraad on haridusest. Magistrikraadi tegi ta juba IT-valdkonnale lähemalt inimese ja arvuti interaktsiooni valdkonnast. Aga doktorikraad juba peaaegu puhtalt IT-valdkonnast. Nimelt Tarkvara haldusest, vist võiks niimoodi eesti keeles tõlkida, inglise keeles on ta software maintenance. Ta põhitöökoht on ülikoolis arendusprorektor, kelle valdkonnaks on siis edendada harituses innovatsiooni ja huvid seonduvad tal eelkõige siis tehnoloogia hariduse edendamisega. Liis, see floor is yours, please. Thank you, Peter. Okay, so fingers crossed, we're going to get some presentation up here. Otherwise, you get to see me without the technology. Oh, password. <laughs> Can I remember it? Yes. <laughs> That's always a good start. So yes, I'm from uh, Newcastle University in Australia. It's very confusing today. You'll see two uh, versions of Newcastle University, totally unrelated to one another. But rather bizarrely, I uh, worked as the director of a center of excellence, which was between the other University of Newcastle. So it's a very confusing life I have. But I'm now in Australia. And as I said, that I am um, responsible for innovation in, in learning and teaching. So I believe I have one of the best jobs in the world, just working uh, with creativity, with technology, and uh, everyone else has to put into place all of my wacky ideas. Oh, I don't know how wacky will translate, but I'm sure you'll cope. We've heard about technology making people brainless. If you think I'm brainless today, Believe me, it's the jet lag, not the, uh, not the technology. The question I've been asking many is, with higher education or in any form of education, I was trained as a, as a secondary school teacher, a high school teacher, and my concern was that we were still teaching as if we were in the uh, 1900s. Higher education and schools haven't really changed in the way of which we engage. It's all about standing at the front and listening. So the teacher is the person who is, if you like, the font of all knowledge, the expert and the person upon which the people in the class, the students in the class, have to capture that knowledge. The problem is, of course, today, there's probably more on, uh, on wikis and blogs and uh, Wikipedia than any individual could convey in any classroom. So the question I have is, what is the value of education if that we carry on having the 1900 style of education? And I think our students are responding accordingly. You know, we're boring them, so we have to change. We're certainly in Newcastle finding that many students are voting with their feet. They're just not coming. And my uh, staff say to me, well, this is not fair. And I say, well, I think it's very fair. You're not educating them in the style of which they want to be educated. So you have to change, not them. But it's not just about them changing. I think it's the higher education environment that needs to change as well. You know, this is an example of uh, one of the laboratories that we expect our students to work in. You know, it's very, very dominated by technology. And I think there's a consequence that we've lost a little bit about the way of which that we need to get students to operate. So yes, I'm a, a really uh, individual who really, really loves technology and really thinks it's the way forward for education. But it's not the only way forward. It's much more about integration in a way that helps them and seamlessly integrates an edu education experience. So, I spent some time in some of the work that I've, I've done in both in the UK and in Australia thinking about what is the classroom of the future, and that's a lot of what I'm going to share with you today. A combination of how to re-envisage re an education and education environment in two ways. One is what the teacher and the student should do in the classroom, and the other one is how that classroom should be designed, and I'm going to bring those two elements together. 
And of course, what do you do when that you want to start and to understand where that vision is of the future, well, you look it up on Google. So if you look on Google about the classroom of the future, this is what you see. It looks smart, doesn't it? But I have to tell you, I will have failed if I end up in my institution with classes looking like this. Oh yeah, it looks really cool. And so cool, in fact, whoever envisaged this protected it really well. I had to uh, do a screen dump. That's why you haven't quite got the, uh, the, the granularity of the picture here. It's so well protected. They think this is the vision for the future that they've protected it on the internet so you can't copy it. Of course, you can copy anything these days. But what I want to do by the end of this talk is make sure that you understand why this is not a good idea. I'm looking at new ways of working, and I think this is so akin to the, new, to the old form of 19th century education. Now, I used to joke in, uh, you know, a couple of years ago about what is the difference between a 19th century education. And the teachers used to say, I know, I know. They had slates in those days. The problem is now, we've gone back to that. You know, the iPad is the equivalent of the slate of many years ago. Has that actually changed in the form of education? Well, no, but I think it must. So as a consequence, what I've been working on is what we're calling the U Online, the University of Newcastle Online Plus strategy. So it's thinking about moving away from the traditional education-based environment to an approach where we're introducing the flipped classroom. Now, the flipped classroom many of you will be aware of, and I'll come, and talk to you in a, I'll come back in a minute and talk about how we're actually implementing it in Newcastle, but first of all, what I'll do is just give you an indication of where we're looking at here. So what we're doing is taking much of that learned content that would have been very didactic in the approach where a teacher stands in front and just conveys knowledge to the class, and instead, to use technology to make that available to students so they can learn any place, anywhere. Students today don't want to be sitting in a classroom at a particular time, in a particular place. And it's certainly in, Newca in Newcastle, we have students who may have to travel four or five hours. New uh, Australia is a <laughs> such a big country. So as a consequence of that, having to travel a long way is, 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 is the norm. But having to travel a, no a long way to just to have something that you could have heard through video is not acceptable to them. So let's take that off and just find ways of which that we can engage staff and, and students. So what we're doing is essentially taking that didactic, that taught traditional element, and giving it accessible to the students before the class. That gives me the great opportunity to completely re-envisage what the class interactive experience will be like. And that's what I'll talk to you a lot about. But of course, in order to do, the, they need to do this before that they can do the interactive experience. And you need to have something that provides the appropriate level of feedback and understanding to test students so that both teachers and the students gain the confidence that they've got the right level of understanding and they're moving through their learning in an appropriate way. The problem with higher education, and particularly some of the faculties that I've been, look, I've been working with, is scale. So typically in classrooms within uh, Australia, we will have four, five, up to, we've got some classrooms that sit 900 students. Now you make an interactive experience with 900 students and I'm impressed. It is really, really hard. So actually what we're starting to do is to think about, are there better ways that we can educate them? And this is where some of the challenge that I've placed has come from. What we've actually started to say is that we will only have classes of around 100 students. So as a consequence of that, that starts to change the nature of, if you like, mass education. What we're now doing is saying that we're going to have that much more interactive experience, that much more engaging approach, but, of course, the risk that I've got here is that I'm going to kill the staff in doing it. That one lecture that they used to have, they may now have to teach up to nine times. But actually, the solution is already here, because the content that they used to have is now in another form. So it's recorded, and we can allow them to actually do, in their own time and their own place, a lot of that learning. 
So what we've started to do is to break those classes down and have far fewer of them. So, of course, the outcome of that is that probably stu students are having about 25% of the class timetabled experiences that they had once had, but in fact, they're getting much more of an engaging education. First of all, been, been able to be able to learn through technology, through interactive experiences, and I'll look at some of the examples we use in a minute, but be able to do it in, any, in their own time and therefore have the same content and learning experiences they've actually always had. But what they also have in addition is that it, different kind of interactive experience. So one of the challenges that we've been looking at within uh, the university is starting to say, well, how can we make this real? And so that we've taken an entire faculty, which is probably around 10,000 students, probably around 1,000 staff, and are over a period of time converting the entire faculty to a flipped learning approach. So that form of engaging with uh, interactive experiences in the classroom, but learning much of the content through technology. Now, what we're actually doing is starting to think about how we can do that in a way of which that we can start to adapt the students over time as well. So one of the big challenges is, of course, I come up with this great idea about engaging in a flipped experience, but then the staff and the students have to change what is probably a mode of education that they haven't experienced ever before. So we're doing it in a little bit of a gradual way, by actually over the years flipping particular years. So we've got three or four levels of education, depending as to whether students take an honours programme or an ordinary degree programme. And what we're doing is every year we're flipping a new level. So this year we've just started to flip the first years. Next year we'll flip the second year experience as well, which means that this year all the new students to Newcastle University will be taught in this new, well, are being taught in this new style of education. They will next year move on to their second year, and they will also continue that experience when, in fact, the second year, the, first, the new lot of first years will come, and therefore we'll have two years that are engaging in this flipped experience. Now, what does that flipped experience mean? Well, essentially, typically an academic will teach for per term, if you like, around 24 hours, maybe sometimes 40 or 50 hours of taught content. What we're actually doing is reducing that. So there's about one hour a week of traditional lectures that become the interactive sessions. And instead, what we um, have are three or four hours of these video content or blogs or other forms of uh, examples, so you can see the um, pre-lecture uh, content is a mixed-media approach. So, saying to the academics, it doesn't actually always have to be a, a video cast. It can be an audio cast, and you know what? It can even be a chapter of a book. So we're not throwing all of the old things that we knew about. We're just starting to re-engage it. What I'm doing is starting to take a different approach to education. At one time, as I said, teachers were the source of all knowledge. Now, what I'm seeing them as, as curators of knowledge, curators of constructs of learning pathways through a program. And that gives me an opportunity to be much more adaptable. So, because I've only got about, rather than having four or five lectures per week, students are now only having one per topic that we teach them, per course that we teach them, it allows a number of things to happen. So for instance, I can do things like stream them based on particular interests. So some of the courses that we teach in the university, there would be a number of students from lots of different degrees. So a maths course may be done by many of the sciences and engineering students. One of the challenges with all of these courses, these service courses as we call them, is that very often they don't engage the students because you can't employ the right kind of case studies that they understand it in the context of their discipline. What this allows us to do is then to group those students together and teach a very specialist interactive experience just for that particular discipline. So alongside being able to re-engage students in the classroom and the classroom activity, we've got the opportunity to specialise it much more for their, their needs and their desires. 
the challenge is, and certainly when I uh, first went to, to Newcastle and they showed me round, I was quite shocked that, that they had what I called the best preserved lecture theatres of a university that's 50 years old. So what they'd done is they'd taken the original design of the lecture theatres and they had kept it exactly like it was. The challenge I had was this was hopeless to do any form of interactive education. So what that they were, they were on fixed seatings with flip tables, and those flip tables, oddly enough, were so big that a student couldn't even move to the side. So actually talking to anyone else was impossible. And of course they were very big, as I said, some of them being uh, over 900 students. So, it just so happened that we were going to build a new presence in the city, and so that we've integrated all of these things all in one. So, in 2017, we're going to move into a building that's going to uh, look quite futuristic, look like this, and that we have explicitly designed this so that there is no lecture theatre over 100, year, 100 seats. So, as a consequence of that, you know, any academic that says, we're not going to do this, I'm going to teach for 900, not in 2017, they won't, because this is about an institution believing in this form of education and going at it wholeheartedly. So, what we now have then is a need to be able to help those students and the staff get to 2017 in our years of flip. So, what we're doing is refurbishing quite a number of the lecture theatres in the institution so that they uh, start to take into account a much more interactive experience. And this is a completely new style of education and a completely new way of working in the institution. And it's been really, really interesting to see it, see it happening and see it start to engage. And I'll show you um, now a video of it. Fingers crossed this will work. Uh, it's a sped up video, but you can see them now starting to teach in this environment. What's interesting about it, I'm starting to get questions about how do you control the class? How do you stop them talking? And you know, to me, that is music to my ears. If students are talking in that classroom, if they're engaging one with one another, they are now learning. They are now having a different kind of experience. So this is really good news. But along with changing the classroom, what I've also acknowledged is that there needs to be quite significant change in the way that we envisage the learning environment outside of the learning and, uh, the learning and teaching in that typical space. Because what we're now doing is implementing activities where students will work as groups, as you can see as the design of this room, and that's why I dislike that other form of education, that example of the futuristic classroom. It's about individual engagement. But to me, I'm very into a social pedagogy where students argue against one another. They debate things. They explain things to one another. And just as we've heard some of the examples today, it's often when students explain it to each other, they can communicate in the language that each other can understand. So what we've also looked at is starting to think about outside that classroom. So the university is no longer just about its lecture halls. It becomes a place, an environment of learning, where that environment of learning it starts to develop what a lot of people are starting to call the sticky campus, that ability to not just go there for your class, to want to stay there, to want to in, uh, in continue to learn and to want to continue to be part of the overall experience. And now certainly in every experience that I've had in different institutions, I've found that the place of learning appears to be the stairs. Students are always sitting on the stairs, they're always learning and group work and activities there. And I asked myself why. And I think the answer is two. One, they kind of like the stairs, and the other one is we give them no option to do anything other than to work on the stairs because there is nothing else. So what I've done, it's a little bit crazy, but I've come up with a solution that I can have both of those in one environment. So you can see here, what I've actually done in an informal learning environment is created a stairway to nowhere. And it actually is a stairway that students can sit on to learn. And all of these boards over here are interactive whiteboards, TV screens, interactions where they can join a laptop, or the good old whiteboard, so they're just a pen and you can write some, some notes down. 
really, really popular with the students because I think this is such a common environment that they're just used to working. And it's got that nice integration of technology. Then we've got lots of informal learning spaces around it, highly comfortable, very relaxing environments. So it really encourages students to want to be there. And certainly some of the experiences that we've had, um, it, 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 on the render it hasn't quite come out here, but at the back of that we've created what? Uh, Newcastle called them, they, they, they called them before I came, what they call survival stations. And these are coffee and tea making facilities, places where you can warm your food up. In the UK, I've never known people implement such things on a, on a campus, but it really does help, I think, in to be able to make that presence of an environment that's friendly, an environment where you think the answer is not to say no, the answer is yes, the students own this space and they can do what's good for them in order to help their learning. So, what we're then looking at is how that we can now move this forward and can keep, keep working in an environment that's helping students learn and helping students understand, but starting to integrate some of the concepts and work that I've done in part of my research. So what I'm starting to look at is how that we can take this forward into uh, the new building for 2017. And this lecture theatre here is one of the new designs that we, we will have. They're actually calling it the Cabaret Lecture Theatre. And then they decided against that because too many people were asking, do we have to sing in it? Oh, no, 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 it's not for singing. So we now call it the immersive environment. And all of this design work came around based on what I, I guess, if I liked to do when I was a student. And I actually used to like working best in a pizza hut. And that pizza hut, that pizza establishment, had that personalization of the space, that grouping that you felt comfortable and you felt as if you owned the place. And so we've been using a lot of those concepts into um, redesign learning spaces around it. But the important thing about my designs compared to often what you'll find in these environments is that I maintain orientation. And that I maintain orientation for a number of reasons, partly to give the teacher a sense of control of that environment, and also to enable um, something that we found from some of the research that we were doing into technology enhanced learning being very important, that being able to move between having teacher-directed environments to plenary sessions. So a bit like you do in conferences where you might have a quick uh, discussion and then you come back with sets of questions, to be able to take that as a form of pedagogy. And what we've got is interactive screens in each of these sessions that a student can control, but then we'll have the technology that a teacher will be able to present that onto the, onto the main screen. And what we've done is, in every example that we have of this floor, so that's the, that was the first floor, this is the second floor, you can see that we've, inv we've introduced no row, you know, a bit like we've got now. None of those, highly flexible based on things that you could move around, things that you've got, uh, group-based spaces. And to take those environments, so this is part of the library design here that we can see in like the cabaret lecture theater into the informal teaching space. So students can feel quite comfortable that they move very seamlessly from something they do into the lecture into something that they do into their informal learning environment. Uh, and so you could see some of the examples. This is level three. There are eight floors of this environment just going up. But essentially, um, I thought I'd just give you a feel for some of the designs of that. And you can see how everything is about introducing and supporting this pedagogy. Uh, you can see that we've got um, one of the more traditional, though not quite implemented in a traditional way, the Harvard Lecture Theatre, where students can face each other and therefore have a great debate with individual sides over it. And part of the work that will happen in here has come from uh, the Faculty of Law. So law, as you can imagine, can have some great debates as, as a consequence of that. So. That's in terms of the infrastructure. What do I want to do in terms of taking that technology further? Well, so a research project that uh, I worked on up until the last year was funded by the um, British, British government, and this was a project called SynergyNet. It was the use of um, large multi uh, 
touch surfaces. So um, if I just flick to this one, you can see an example of the classroom. You've all got an iPhone, an iPad, I no doubt. What we were doing, we envisaged this and put the bid in long before even the iPad was even existing. But to have that concept of that being the surface of the classroom. Because what I was finding in a lot of the um, examples where we were working with interactive screens on the side is that there became a dominance effect. So whoever happened to be sat by the keyboard, whoever happened to be sat by the interactive screen, controlled that discussion. And invariably, if you look at the gender, invariably, it's, it's a male student who will, who will dominate. So I was very interested in saying, how can we prevent that form of domination happening by giving everyone access to it. And obviously the answer to that was to multi-touch, where everyone had access, anyone could pull up a keyboard and we could have the special technology that would allow us to derive those classrooms. So in this SynergyNet project, we had an idea of, yeah, let's make that happen, but let's network those so that, for instance, anyone working here could send information to something that was on another table, or anything that was on the table could be sent to the teacher board. And you could see how I was then trying to support this plenary-based session where individuals who were working in the classroom could shoot their stuff off to the teacher board, and an engaging discussion could happen between the classroom and the teacher. So I'm really changing the nature of the way this happened. So we built this by, through the support of the, of the government. We built the software around it, and we got um, a company who actually supplied McDonald's to help us build the furniture so it was robust enough to use in both primary and high schools, secondary schools within the, the United Kingdom. And we got lots of teachers in to come and try it out. So I'll give you a quick, quite a, a quick example of how it worked. You get to learn um, some Geordie, which is the Newcastle accent, but not in Australia, this is in England, we, we, we videoed this. Uh, I hope you can understand it, but it doesn't matter so much. <laughs> See how that they're, they're interacting with the table, direct touch, just like your iPhone. Point out a clue that might show you. Do you think you can, young man? Yeah, come on, show, come on, show everybody. So how many in the average ride? We've got our school. Can I send something? So you can see how there is a number of things. The way of which the networking technology was the, we were using in order to be able to move from one classroom-based uh, uh, experience to another. But what was also interesting from that as well is how the teacher brought the student up and started to get the student to interact with the board. He actually didn't need to do that because he could have done it from the, the table. But that's another important element that I just want to make a comment on. You can introduce as much new technology in the classroom as you like, but you need to retrain the teachers to be able to use it and to adapt to that technology. That was an important lesson that we've learned and one that the reason why we have that phased approach into moving to the flipped classroom in, in Newcastle. So, of course, I would really love to, uh, to do this as well within uh, the university. And next year, we're having an awful job in getting somebody brave enough, a company brave enough to build this without charging us millions and millions of dollars to do it. But we have a plan, and we're out to tender at the moment. So if you know anyone who wants to work in Australia, do let us know. Uh, and what we're doing is um, reconverting these, the raked classrooms, the ones where the, traditionally they would be on, on stairs, if you like, taking out a number of those, um, those levels and making them as a flat surface so that we can put these group work tables on it. So we're completely changing the nature of the, the teaching environment, but actually have those surfaces that we're actually doing with projection surfaces in this case, just because of the cost. But these projection services, then, we would really love to be able to have that interactive technology put on it. So we're going to run some tests later. We will build this um, at the second semester of this year. So we will start um, around June, July time with the anticipation of opening it for the next academic year, which starts in February in Australia. 
But we're also changing not only the learning and teaching environments, we say we're changing the informal learning space, but we're also changing the way of which staff, professional staff, engage with students. And so part of the classroom design is changing away from an environment where, for instance, the library would sit behind a desk and students would have to come and start to ask them questions. Because what we want is to take the university to a new era so it becomes a much more of an interactive experience. So what we've done in, for all of the service classes, both the library and all the student services, is take away every desk, every reception desk in the institution I'm getting rid of. And the reasoning for that is to break down these barriers and to make students feel that it is their environment as well. So while we're providing helpful classes, we'll provide helpful support services as well. And a lot of this new design um, approach that we're using in this new building will allow us to emulate uh, that kind of environment. But fortunately, our good old librarian uh, said, oh, okay, so if we're practicing new forms of learning and teaching, can we be the one who practices this new form of the service model? And the good old, our good old librarian, Greg is his name, came in over a weekend and he turned all the desks around. So when all the staff came in on Monday, those traditional desks that used to have to sit behind and had that barrier away for students, gone. Their tables were, in fact, now around the other way. They weren't very happy when they came in, but after an hour, they loved it. That form of interaction, that engagement, the excitement, and the pleasant environment that they were suddenly working in just changed. It absolutely is just such a vibrant place, and all he did was turn the desks around. So that leaves me very optimistic for the new design that we will have in the, in the library, when there won't be these, these forms of barriers. Here's the, the kind of reception desk where anyone can mill around. You know, I learned in a, in a classroom that very often students would say, um, when you pass them, can I have help? Yet you had been sitting in your desk for maybe 20 minutes and nobody had asked you a question. So this is, to me, is also about taking that living experience outside the classroom and completely changing the nature of the way the institution operates. So that gives you a bit of a feel for the kind of changes we're making, both in terms of the learning and teaching experience, how we're integrating technology, think in a more seamless way than making the technology the thing. The thing is the education, but the education is actually the learning that the students are doing that is the change. So that we're offering, if you like, a approach to learning and teaching that is a strategic approach. Very often in previous institutions that I've worked, that our changes have been because individual champions want to make change. The problem when you get individual academics like that adopt a new pedagogy is, it's quite confusing for students because there's lots of different approaches used right across the institution. So I think we're probably the first institution, certainly in Australia, that said, no more, we will do it like this, and to have that whole of the institution-based approach. So all students are taught in this way, and this becomes the natural form of pedagogy rather than the normal teaching talking. That consistency, I think, is important, but we've gone outside of the classroom experience to take that into a whole institution approach. So it's about the informal learning spaces, but it's interact also about the interaction of the support services. What we've learned is you cannot do that unless that you have an appropriate design to match it. So that design needs to be quite flexible. It needs to be group-oriented because if students are talking, as far as I'm concerned, that's that first step to learning. And if it's gonna be technology-driven, then it needs to be an investment in technology for learning. So it isn't about giving it to the teachers and to say, look, don't you look smart. It's about actually giving that technology to the students because actually they're the one that's comfortable with using it. They're the one that are used to using it in the high schools and, the, and if not the kindies these days. You know, it's their technology and they need to feel as if that educational experience has continued within higher education, not suddenly changed into something that was a 19th century form of education. I'm a very great fan of promoting group-based education, and that, I think, is again another important element that we're seeing a difference. Very often, 
40,000 students in Newcastle University, people don't get to know each other. If they work in a group, they start to get to know each other, and that is helping quite significantly in us um, on our retention program, so fewer students leave because that they actually have that peer support group that is infinitely better than any service that we can offer as a professional service across the institution. The other element I think we've learned from is about, it isn't about whole class discussion, it isn't about just about group discussion, it's that interaction between the two. And the, what we're finding is that this grouping between Students go off and do a little activity, and then a teacher does a plenary session. That helps the students know we've got to get this done because we could be asked to contribute, but, and therefore it helps with pacing. So it gives the t teachers that sense of control that otherwise I think you can potentially lose, and that sense of being able to feel as if I can keep other students informed why others are doing, and that different form of learning that you get through it. So that's all I'm going to add. That is, you know, I've given you a broad feel for some of the things that we do. I think we have some time for questions, do we? Yes? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, extremely interesting indeed. Uh, may I ask a uh, question in Estonian? Uh, I, I suppose it will be translated to in English. Yeah. Palun, kas on küsimusi? Anne Riddel, väga kavigal How many teachers you lost who refused to come together with your new ideas? <laughs> <laughs> a, a very good question. Uh, we, we have not lost any yet, though I do have a few that are dissenting some, somewhat, I have to say. What we did was that we got a couple of uh, teachers who were really keen to do it the year before, and then to, to help mentor and guide those staff members through the approach. And I think that that was the thing that gave all of the teachers a bit more confidence. What we did was we gave them uh, student reviews, so that helped as well. And that we gave them a reassurance that if the student reviews weren't good, we wouldn't take it out on them personally. So they're, they're more prepared to work I in that. But I haven't actually had anyone who's both refused to do it or resigned over it. Et väike vahe märkus, et küsimus on võimalik esitada ka Hitsa Innovatsiooni keskuse veebi lehekaudu. Ja te võite esitada küsimuse ka eesti keeles, see kõik tõlgitakse. Palun. Jaa. Thanks a lot, Liz. Um, would you say that financially uh, these, uh, these plans have been, uh, I mean, impl implementation-wise, is this something you've sketched for, say, 10 to 12 years, and it's only now coming to life, so to speak? Because it's a costly thing, in it? Thank you. Uh, no, I've actually only been in Newcastle University for two years, so this is something that I um, planned within the first six months of being there, and that we then got operational within to, to run it for the first um, uh, semester of last year uh, as a pilot, and then we're running it in, in the full program uh, for, for this, uh, this, uh, this academic year. However, the building that we're using um, had been funded in advance, so we'd had funding the year before I came, but we hadn't really um, thought about how that we were going to implement and what it was going to be. We had promised, because of the funding, um, that we would do something different. We just hadn't decided what different meant. Yeah, thank you. Küsin siis Eesti keelesse. Kui me eelmise aasta novembris kohtusime, siis ma küsisin teie tuleviku plaanide kohta. Ja te ütlesite, et sellel aastal te kavatsete muuta saja õppejõu õpetamisharjumusi. Kuidas teil seni läinud on, kas see sada õpetajat on võimalik ära muuta? Well, you saw uh, one picture of the, the classroom in, in, in operation, you know, in the, those snapshots where that they pin together as, a, as an example. Uh, 
so far, the experience is, is good. Uh, the teachers are actually enjoying it. Um, the, however, I still think we've got a bit to go in terms of training. Now, what is very interesting for me is actually in that small clip, there's, the teacher is moving around quite a lot, but actually the students aren't doing an awful lot. So I think we've still got quite a lot of, um, of work to go to give the staff the confidence that within that teaching session, it's not only just about them. And I think that, that, that uh, occasionally I go and spy on what's going on in, in some of these classrooms, and there are student activities happening, but I don't think that they happen as um, in small snapshots as, as we probably need to operate. So what I think that there is a tendency to do is I, uh, the a teacher will give a, a large or long introduction, then there's a reasonably long student activity, and then there's a wrap-up session in the end. But what I'd actually like is a longer period between the swapping of small activities and lots more interaction. What it might be doing, and I think we're, we'll have to wait till the end of the year to um, get the full evaluation, but what I think it's starting to do is to challenge the value now of the 51-hour minute lecture. At one time, we're saying, too long, too long. Now I think I'm beginning to say, too short, which I think is, is, is great, because I would actually rather have a, a longer session where students can, can get into and to travel in can get into, this is a long time to travel for an hour session. So if you travel in for two or three, it's a much more valuable. But we've got to make sure that that experience is a good experience. And I think a gentle move in that direction is, is what we need. Thank you. Mul on küsimus ümberpööratud klassiruumi kohta, kus õpeta peab muutuma. Ma olen nõus õpilase puhul, kui suurt õpimotivatsiooni te hetkel eeldate tudengil ja kui suurt õpimotivatsiooni näiteks kolme aasta pärastest ümberpööratud klassiruum eeldab väga suurt enese dissipliini. Yeah, so absolutely, motivation is um, essential. What we've tried to do is to work on a number of aspects that we know students are motivated through, and students are very assessment oriented. So what we've done is that through, you saw in that example where I've got the activities that are happening, uh, we have dedicated for every course that we offer 10% of the marks for those activities that students would do so that we've kind of worked a little bit with them to get them in the mode of doing the advanced learning because that's the crucial thing and that's the thing that I think staff worry about most. What happens if I come into a classroom expecting students who have done pre-work which they have not? So by having a portion of the allocated marks for the, for the activity of the course being dedicated to that pre-activity, it gives students that motivation. What I'm hoping in time is that we don't need that. Once that they get into this mode of operation, that it will be a change in nature of it. But equally so, I'd like to see that we start, and, and my next task is to start reinventing the assessment system of the university, which is something we'll work on this year. Because very often, when you look at the research, flipped learning is less advantageous when that you run it with a traditional assessment system. And very often, when you look at the differences between the two modes of learning, there isn't that much difference. But actually, most of the researchers in the, in the field believe it's because a traditional exam works to very much a rote learning approach, which is what you're move, trying to move away from. So it needs to be done hand in hand. I'm quite comfortable at the moment that that engagement with the learning in advance leads to outcomes and marks and assessment techniques that integrate with it. But what I think we need to then do is to re-envisage what the final assessment approaches are. And I think if we get that right, that can start to help re-motivate students in the classroom as well, because it would be better aligned between what they do in the class, what they do in their own learning, and how they're then assessed on it. 
Et kui tohib ma kommenteeriksin nenda poolt, et see on tõesti suur probleem. Me oleme ka katsetanud ülikoolis seda ümberpööratud klassiruumi, mis eeldab, et üliõpilane kodus õppib midagi ette ära ja klassis toimub diskussioon, arutelu ja nedasi ja paraku peab tunnistama, et siiski on üliõpilase ja kohati päris palju, kes ei tee seda ja siis on ta klassis sõna otsas mõttes, et ta ei ole midagi teha sest et ta ei tea midagi, ta ei oska, ei osale selles arutelus ja ta on sisuliselt välja lülitatud sellest õppetööst. Võibolla ma küsiksin Liisilt, et kuidas siis, antke meile üks retsept, mis siis teha? Sellist üliõpilastega, kes ei tee seda eelnevat tööd. Actually, I think it's peer pressure. So what um, I've very often done is try to integrate the group-based activities that we do in the classroom with the group-based assessment that we operate in the end. And, and certainly I was noticing the impact of um, attendance on group-based activity as well. What we started to do was to have a competition. There were no marks for it. There was no even a prize for it. But to say the group that wins in a particular semester is going to be the group that had the best attendance. And it was just, you know, every lecture I used to have a little star that would, would come up to say who was the leading ones. And actually, I have known students come into that being ringing other students to be able to say, where are you? You need to be here. We need to win this competition this year. Peer pressure is something I don't think we use enough in the classroom. And peer pressure used in the right way can become a kind of friendly banter that becomes a fun aspect of the class. And certainly, I think that that is probably one of the things that we don't use enough. And it is a great tool that we could potentially use to start to change the way of which students see that classroom and see their uh, engagement in learning as being not an individual approach to learning, but more a team-based approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Kas on veel küsimusi? Et kogu ümber pööratud õppe eesmärk on see, et, et tudengid õpiksid rohkem paremini ja saaksid äh, elu sedas pidi paremini kas... hakkama. Kas äh, samas hindamissüsteemid on jäänud samaks, ehk et teksam või midagi muud ja numbrid? Siis äh, küsimus on selline, et kas tudengite välja langevus on teil ka mureks ja kuidas te eeldate, et selline õppe lähenemine võiks mõjutada välja langevust ja kas see on juba täna tulemusi annud? So retention is, is an issue. Um, we have a institution that would be um, what we would call in, in the UK is a widening participation program so that we would take students who would be first in family, students who no one in their family had ever taken a higher education qualification before. We have a lot of mature students. 60% of the students are what we call non-traditional students. Uh, in uh, Australia, that, that we have a large program trying to bring Aboriginal students into the classroom, which typically haven't been studying higher education. And we have the largest number of Aboriginal students studying in Newcastle University. All of those uh, students lead to potential challenges in terms of retention because they have life going on around them, unlike traditional students who come directly from school who uh, don't have families to, to be responsible for and probably uh, studying full-time, which a large number of our students are studying part-time. So typically, the, the, our dropout rate would be um, probably around 10 to 15 percent. What um, we can't say yet, because it's too early within this program, is how much we're able to change that through, through retention. But what I can say is that we're also measuring um, students' wellness. We've have, we have a program in the university called the Healthy University Program, because what we've found is that typically in Australia, students are saying they feel very stressed, they feel um, ill, both physically and mentally, and horrendously, 30% are saying they do not feel well enough really to study. That is in itself, I think, a huge problem that we have with the younger generation these days and the pressures that we're putting on them for varying ways. What we're finding, however, is that by knowing other people, they share those concerns, they share those worries, and as a consequence for that, they then start to understand it's not just them that feels like 
that they're not coping, that they're having difficulty, and life is a challenge for them. So what I can say at the moment is that we're finding that students are positively engaging with one another, and that appears, at least in the early stages, to mean that we have lost far fewer students, and in fact, we've registered more students as well, so that the um, students who've actively selected to do these courses has quite significantly increased. So at the moment, it's very positive. Of course, what I want to know is, you know, are we going to retain them to the point when they complete their degree? That, to me, is the success mark. Getting them to stay on a little bit longer is good, but only if they ultimately complete their degree. So I'm afraid I have to come back in three years to tell you what the answer to that one is. Üks küsimus tuli ka interneti kaudu, et ma loen selle ette Ausutada ka ma ise päris hästi, sest küsimust aru ei saa, aga, aga võib-olla lihtsalt järsku saab. Et kõlab ta selliselt, kuidas muuta alkooli õpilase lapsevanema aru saamist ümber pööratud klassiruumist? Kuidas muuta? Järelikult alklassi õpilase lapsevanemal on mingi aru saam, mis ilmselt ei ole õige. Küsimus on, kuidas seda muuta? I, I think that is a good, it's a great question because I think that very often parents value an education and expect that education to be like the education experience they have. So I think it's a primary level, but it's also at higher education. People are saying, ah, but you're making them come in far less. Ah, you're giving them all these things to do on their own. What is the value of this? Surely you should be teaching my kids. And so it, it is a big challenge into how that you work with the parents to understand that it's about engagement with learning that makes learning happen, not about that passive reception of information and rote learning and um, regurgitation, if you like, of the answers in, in the end. So it, it, is, it is an education program that we, we, have to, we have to employ that not only takes into account the new teachers and how we appropriately train the teachers, how we appropriately support and re-educate students, but how we can get parents on board. So, you know, in a, in a primary and, and, and high school, secondary school experience, uh, the parents are going to be the ones that really help us uh, ensure that students do the activities. So they're absolutely crucial in, in engaging with it. What we've been doing in, in Newcastle is, is using um, teacher and um, parent-teacher events in order to be able to talk about this new form experience, talk about some of the research, and talk about the outcomes that have been attained from that, and to convince them, actually, it's far harder to engage in this form of education. It's far easier to just to talk but to think of ways of explaining, engaging students and, and teaching in a flip mode is harder, not an easy option. And I think that's, that's an important message we need to get out of there. So it's a great question. No, yeah. Hi, actually my voice is quite loud. <laughs> yeah, but we need for recording. Uh, so thank you. Actually, I've worked with a lot of parents trying to tell them about how to connect with their children in technology. And oftentimes, I ask them, do you ever Google for information? Have you ever used uh, Google Maps to find something? Have you ever shopped on the internet? I've tried to show the parents that they are engaging in technology the same way that their students or their children are engaging. And so they make that relationship between what they do as adults and what they see their children doing. And I find that that's a nice way to kind of make them realize uh, the way students are learning is social, the way we all learn. It's a social way of becoming better. Oh. Yeah, so thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Kas on veel küsimusi, kommentaare? Oh, isegi mitu. Tere ja ate. Aga kui suur on teie vilumuse saavutamine selles pööratud klassiruumis ja kuidas te saavutate kirjutamise selles klassiruumis? I, I mean, how successful we've been, uh, um, we're getting the teachers to evolve their education experience, and I think we've got a long way to go in that. You know, I talked about already the way of which the teacher relinquishes control to the students is something I think yeah, that we need to work on over time and give them more and more confidence. And I think that confidence will grow. 
In terms of literacies, I think that the, in a higher education context, there are multiple literacies upon which um, that we're trying to promote, you know, a, a, a sense of mathematical literacy. What the flipped classroom does do very well is promote um, a, if you like, the social, the uh, English literacies by arguing and debating and really engaging in depth. But also I think the other important literacy it does is the technological literacy. Because when that we give the toys, if you like, to the students, we then require them to be the one who starts to curate the activities that they do, define their own pathways through it, look at the way technology can um, support them in that process of learning. And you know, the one thing that I've always been nervous about in a, in a higher education experience is really that education to learn. And you know, to me, it's not about the discipline clearly that it is about the discipline as well, but I think that's the bit we do well. What we don't do so well is teach students the literacy of learning, and that is to be able to say, this isn't going to be a degree that's going to carry me through the rest of my life. My degree needs to be in the process of learning, so as whatever discipline I'm studying evolves over time, I can keep bringing up in my professional life the standard of my discipline-based knowledge to keep up with the new practices. And to me, the important aspects of all of these literacies in the classroom is how that you compose that together to give yourself the confidence that my education has set me up for the future. And therefore, I think that's the difference I would see between offering a training and an educational approach that really supports lifelong learning. And so that's, to me, what I'm trying to attain as a change in my classrooms, is less reliance on the knowledge of a particular subset of discipline content, but more to how to get that content, to learn that content, and to realize that you don't actually have to have somebody who is going to teach you directly to engage with that content. If you can get access to it, you can start that process of learning yourself. Suur tänu, mul on selline tunne, et selle teemaga me veel ei piirdu, et me ilmselt peame ka järgmisel ja ülejärgmisel ja, 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 ja selle teema juurde tagasi tulema. Liis, suur tänu, meil on teile ka väikesed kingitused. That was very energetic. Eh, Rubi Kukubik, oh, oh, seda te teate. Me. Yeah, see, Thank you, I'll yeah. be practicing forever. Ah, see ei ole kõik, see ei ole kõik. Uh, actually, you see, you certainly know that uh, Skype comes from Estonia. So we have many more inventions, not just Skype. Skype <laughs> is just one of them. Okay. See, here you see is another. Oh, you wow. probably <laughs> don't know what does it mean, click and grow. Uh, you see, if you put some water into it, yeah. you will see some plants will come up. <laughs> So I don't know whether those plants are eatable or not, uh, but in any way, it uh, somehow symbolizes something new that comes from nothing. Thank you. Like uh, ICT and education. Your best invention yet. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.